I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Dane Baptiste. Some of you may remember me from two hours ago when I was on the same stage. Uh, it's such fun that I'm now back. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, this uh, panel discussion, which is entitled Fuck the System. So you can swear and stuff, yeah. And also, fuck the system. So they were like, Dane, would you like to do another, another panel show? And I was like, I don't know. And it was like, it's called Fuck the System. And I was like, I like doing that. So um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel today. Uh, please welcome. Well, this should go there. Ooh, hello. Please welcome. And I'll slide again, here. Chrissy Levitt and Hayden Do oh. You want to sit under your photo? Where are you sitting? In the middle? I think, yeah, I'll sit in the middle. Oh. So, oh, okay. um, well obviously we've introduced the guys, you can see their names on the back there, but um, if you guys would be so kind as to introduce yourself to our lovely audience and tell them what they do. Uh, there will also be pictures in this uh, discussion, so that's nice for you. Yeah. Just break, just, yeah, there you go, just break it up a bit. Something to focus on. So uh, I will introduce from my left to my right. Hi everyone, I'm Alice Flanagan. I'm a managing partner at Saatchi and Saatchi. I believe we also have to describe who we are and what we're wearing as well, is that right? Yes, yeah, so, so obviously we'll be giving descriptions of our appearance to some people that may be orderly impaired. So, there's that. So, I'm 5'7", I'm wearing a black skirt and a stone-coloured top, and I'm fair-haired. Um, I'm here because we run a programme at Saatchi and Saatchi called Uprizer, which is all about uh, driving creativity and careers ambition within schools across the country. So, we're coming to talk about how passionate we are about that as part of this group. Thank you, Alice. Hi, I'm Chrissy Levert. I'm a middle-aged white lady wearing <laughs> Crocs, oh. much to my, uh, everyone I know hates them. I've been wearing them for years and apparently now they're trendy. I'm wearing cycling shorts and a pink uh, top that I got in a charity shop. And um, I'm the founder of an organization called Creative Conscience. It's a global digital platform that was set up to encourage, train, reward creative thinkers to use their talent for social and environmental impact. And if it's okay, we're just going to show a little video, a call to action video. The choice. What will you do with your creativity? Will you create more hate, waste, destruction, corruption, sadness, madness, pain, shame, isolation, and exploitation? Or will you create more happiness, hopefulness, empathy, stability, honesty, equality, regeneration, preservation, opportunity, and unity? Let's create change. Not just more of the same. Creative conscience. If you are a creative and want to help make the world a better place, join our movement at creative-conscience.org.uk. So yeah, that's what we do. Thank you for having us. Very excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, I will introduce myself, I'm Dane Baptiste. If you are listening, I am six foot one, and I like to think I am a mix of Usher and Dave Chappelle. <laughs> I don't recall that being a joke, but thanks everyone. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, that is my description. And uh, I, slim-ish? Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Hi everybody, can you hear me? Brilliant, uh, my name's Hayden Carodas. I am six one, I'd say. Give or take. I've got a, a black waistcoat on, white shirt, and black trousers. Um, I work in the arts and culture sector, helping them with social media, digital strategy, and general being great online. Cool. Give us a, a round of applause and welcome our panel, please. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so um, I'll be doing my utmost to uh, chair this panel, and hopefully, it can help. Let's direct this as smoothly as possible. We should be going for about half an hour, give or take, and we'd also love to leave some time for any questions you guys may have. So save them up. Please do not be shy. We welcome all of your inquiries. Uh, but with that being said, I'd like to get started. Uh, so there'll be a series of statements I'll read, and uh, we'll turn to the panel for their interpretation of said statements. So um, I'd like to start, it says, <clears throat> collectively, 
The UK's creative industries are one of the UK's largest, most high-profile sectors and internationally respected sectors. This affords it considerable soft power. Do you think the industry does enough to represent itself at the highest levels of politics and business? And I would like to start with yourself, Alice, please. I think with a lot of the government's instability recently, we're struggling to see a really long-term commitment to driving creativity and driving the future of the industry. I think we're heading for a creative crisis in our schools, in, in careers, and in the outputs of our creative businesses in the next years. So I do worry that as a creative industry in its widest sense, from filmmaking to production to uh, drama to arts to theatre to advertising to communications, that there is a, a bigger job to be done collectively to drive the impact of what we're doing. The industries contribute 100 and 115 billion a year to the economy, and we know that only £9.40 is spent on a secondary school child per year on creative subjects. So there's a chasm in those two figures, and I think the creative industries do need to do more to make themselves represented to government, to create more impact, more conversation, and get greater commitment from the current government, upcoming governments. It was great to see the Labour Party this week talk about their vision for creativity up to 16 in schools. And I think it's only with that that we will see greater um, impact from the creative industries, greater investment in our future and the future of the industry. Thank you. Wholeheartedly agree. Uh, Chrissy, um, same question posed to you. Do you think that uh, the industry does enough to represent itself at the highest levels of politics? No, it doesn't. It does virtually nothing. I think it's cowardly. I think it's weak. And it's pretty shameful. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to find a greater voice. We need to find some balls. We need to lobby governments. We should be less concerned with making profit and more concerned with changing the world. Agreed. Well said. <laughs> Very well said. Um, so, as you can see, Hayden, the situation looks very bleak. From your perspective, how uh, do you feel like the industry represents itself at these higher levels? I think the question is, um, is a funny one, and I say that because if you turn on your TV screens, if you look on social media, if you look on the on, on internet, all you see is creativity. All you see is musicians, artists, um, creators across every kind of platform. How else can you represent yourself if all of your community, if all of your audiences all only speak about being creative? It doesn't make sense. The government's meant to work for the people and the people clearly, clearly, push creativity in, in every aspect of their life and every, in every aspect of what they do. So in order to, the, the, the notion or the idea that we're stepping away from that doesn't make any sense and it's obviously not the, not the, the voice or the thoughts of the people. Oh, very good. So I think collectively the answer is definitely no. <laughs> Lots of work to be done there, guys. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, which obviously leads us into our next statement uh, because obviously we are all understanding of the situation as it stands. What more uh, can this industry do to deliver effective representation of the creative sectors at a national level and help to positively shape the government's thinking and policies? Now that we know the problem, uh, Hayden, I'll go to you first uh, for any proposed solutions. What can we do? Um, we have a lot of people who think the same. Mm -hmm. um, and when you, when you have people whose mindsets and views are all from the same background, there's a saying, kinfolk, not all kinfolk are the same, or skinfolk, or not all skinfolk are kinfolk. Um, and if everybody collectively has the same kind of mindset, nothing will ever change. And so it, at the moment, our government obviously ha only looks one way. And, and although there's, there's a, a brown person or there's brown people in the government, their mindsets and their views and their schooling and their belief systems are always exactly the same as the previous governments or pre previous regimes. Mm -hmm. In order for you to actually understand people or, or have different viewpoints or different thinking, you need to be around people. Mm -hmm. So there are things like maybe reverse mentoring. There are ways of putting yourself in different rooms and different, in different positions. And not being in the rooms just as a token, but being in those rooms to actually listen. Mm -hmm. Being in those rooms to actually 
embrace what somebody's saying, embrace what different views on, on lives are, different views on creativity are, different views on how to be successful. And those are the issues where I think the government are lacking at the moment. They, they stick to their, to their boys club and that's it. So you feel like there's maybe, the representation is only on a superficial level just exactly. for optics exactly. and there needs to be a lot more involvement. Very valid point, Hayden, thank you very much. Uh, Chrissy, so you're very vocal about the lack of <laughs> balls in this government and the higher echelons of business. Um, what do you think would be, uh, what can the industry do to kind of divert, to deliver more effective representation in your opinion? Well, I think Hayden and I had a conversation before this, and the kind of question really to the government is about like, how many leaders, so-called leaders, do we have representing us that have ever come from a creative background? Can, I mean, I don't know, but I don't think there's any. Can you imagine anyone in senior government that have been to art school or music college or anything? No. So they don't understand. So if they don't understand, how are they ever going to think about it, right? So really, we need to change the political system. Now, that's a massive, massive thing that we have to do. You know, to get rid of the House of Lords, we have to get rid of the sort of despicable behaviour that's going on. So that's a really big thing to ask. As an industry, we are super, super powerful. We can change the hearts and minds. We do it every day for brands. We persuade people to buy stuff they don't need. What would, what would it look like if we, as an industry, decided to empower people to get off their phones and off the sofas and into the streets to create the change that we need within our system. And people say, the system is broken. Our education system is broken. It's not broken. It's been designed to work for the few. And the few are quite often white blokes. No offense, I've got one of those at home and I gave birth to two. But it's really just about being brave and understanding that we cannot continue to feed a capitalist system which is destroying all our futures. So how do we take what we do, make sure that we can survive, make sure that we can still support a system and shift to another system? There's amazing things that are happening. There's cradle to cradle. There's Kate Rayworth's circular economy. There are businesses, individuals, and um, NGOs that are putting people and planet first, and they're successful and they are thriving. So that's what we have to do as businesses, agencies, and pra practitioners. That's what I think. Thank you. Alice? I completely agree. It's, um, it's our collective responsibility, isn't it? And I think we underestimate it as creative businesses. And we are so numerous, I think we need to recognize that. And I think we need to take action um, in order to influence, because clearly there isn't enough influence the government to, to make change. We at Saatchi have a program called Uprise. We work with Harris Academy Greenwich. For the last three years, we have... Uh, we run a program with them which is all about inspiring how creativity can help their career paths. Um, so we do assemblies, workshops, career support, curriculum support and mentoring. And we've had really, really effective um, responses and some real impact in terms of Ofsted reporting, career horizons and um, soft metrics around um, aspirations. We then decided that we need to do that more widely. So we onboarded ITV to come on and be our partner, and we're just about to launch two other companies as part of that partnership. And that is our demonstration, that it is our collective responsibility to do it, to do it together, and not just try and do it in one, one company doing one thing, but actually to get everyone, without competition, making impact in these areas where it matters. And we believe that that is done very effectively in schools when people are making decisions about careers and future careers and creative. But critically, the word collective and collaboration, I think, are the really important things. Use our power, our capability, our might, and our um, influence to get to government, get to DCMS, get to the Department of Education, to get that money back into, not out of STEM, but get a lot of it back into creative careers and curriculum. Yeah. 
So I guess to you want to add that Sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so to summarise, obviously, I think the general consensus is that everyone wants it to be a collaborative effort, which doesn't involve exploitation of resources, particularly a human resource, and also a process of empowering and uh, educating at grassroots level, right down to school age. Uh, hopefully, culminating in people uh, being able to be in rooms in earnest and contribute effectively, rather than just be there to make up numbers or aesthetics. So, uh, great work. Uh, to the panel. Um, definitely in line with beginning to fuck the system as it exists. <laughs> um, here is a, another question for you guys. Um, question is, because obviously within the creative industry there's a lot of sub-industries or sub-genres in the same industry, and the question is that are each of the creative industries too siloed and isolated? Does there need to be more collaborative effort across the diverse range of creative sectors, and what might this look like in practice? Um, going to switch things up. I'm going to start with Chrissy because your two applause breaks in. It's going great. Okay. And uh, we're all. I paid inside. people. I've got paid people in there. I've got oh, I like money, but well, not that way. <laughs> no, no. More like in a way to help other people, not in a capitalist way. No, no. But I digress. Sorry, Chrissy. Okay, um, okay, <laughs> so, okay carry on. Um, Do you think the industries are too separate and siloed? And, yeah, you know, I'd like to show an example of something if that's all right. Absolutely. So I'll just explain this as a project that we did. We call ourselves Positive Creative Activists. And um, last year we worked with policymakers across South Africa and NGOs and four different arts university um, arts universities in South Africa around a really massive issue. So South Africa has um, a pandemic a silent pandemic, it's, it's around toxic masculine behaviour and it's all around gender-based violence. Seven women every day in South Africa are murdered. They have one of the highest femicide rates in the world. 40,000 young girls fell pregnant, underage girls fell pregnant in the last four years, some of them as young as 10 years old. It is a huge, huge problem. So we, as a charitable organization, worked with universities, we worked with filmmakers, writers, graphic designers, motion graphics, social media people, alongside others, to create a campaign that was seen by 150,000 young men and boys in townships and in um, youth clubs across South Africa around this idea of gender-based violence and consent. And this is just one tiny little bit of that campaign that went out. So... Someone lovely behind there. Could you play our video? Thanks. Getting consent for kissing and touching and sex every time. So what's consent really mean? Consent is a clear and excited, yes, both people really want it. I have to ask for a strong yes every time. I want to hear them say yes, and they must be happy and excited. Anything else is not consent. So that project, as I said, we work with educators, social workers, policy makers, filmmakers, writers, dancers, all manner of people in the creative sector to create this huge, huge campaign. And that project, our side of it, cost absolutely nothing. It didn't cost a single penny. It just took the power of collective consciousness to come together to create change. So I think we all have the ability to work in an altruistic way across different sectors. As an organization, we work with architects, fashion designers, writers, animators, textile designers, you name it, we work across all those different sectors to come up with projects and ideas that are going to positively, positively change our world. And I would just urge people to start thinking, like Alice said, as a collective conscious, like to really think about how we can 
change the narrative of this dog-eat-dog -dog world that we live in this system that's all about, you know, getting on and putting each other down, not that we need to work together as just ordinary human beings to solve the world's greatest issues. Thank you very much. I'd love to go around as the point there. Um, Hayden, just following on from Chrissy, obviously you've shown proof of what happens when there is a positive collaboration. In your experience, have you seen a lot of isolation or siloing, as we refer to it, within the creative industry? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. So it depends on what, 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 how you're viewing it. So if you're viewing it as creative agencies and the, the creative in that kind of sense, then it's one world. If you're then looking at it as the music or an industry, that's another world. If you're then looking at it as yeah. the film industry, they're different worlds. They obviously cross-pollinate as and when they need to. Uh -huh. Is there an idea that there could be a collective where they all push government agendas or could there be an a, a, a initiative that starts off like that where different creators from different sectors come together to create an initiative and create change? That, that can obviously be something that could be interesting. But I think ultimately, if there's no desire from higher ups to actually have a change, and if there's no reason for them to see it in front of them and say, okay, why do we need to make a change? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't matter. Because like, like I said before, if you open your phones, all you're going to see is people being creative in one way or another. And if, if people, if the government can look at that and ignore that, then you can, it, it doesn't matter what we do in that regard. So there needs to be a collective of more powerful people, more senior people who can say, this is how we, why we need to make these changes. And even during, um, there, was a, there was a time when a lot of the, 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 the top dogs in the theater world got together and did all these kind of petitions and, and wrote to government. Government, don't, they don't care. <laughs> it just, it doesn't, that doesn't affect them. So there needs to be more of an active movement from the people to say, okay, this is what we want to happen now. And actually, keep pushing that narrative themselves. So you feel like uh, in that respect then, as well as the, it's not just the industries, it has to be the stakeholders in that industry as exactly. well to be a part of that driving mm. practice. Makes sense. Thank you very much, Hayden. And finally, Alice, do you find in your uh, experience that the creative industries are very siloed and what in, uh, would collaboration look like in practice? I think as um, Chrissy said, everything on this topic, it's absolutely about leaving your ego at the door, leaving your agency name or your own you know, preciousness around it must be ours to going, I will work with a cohort of other people and all their expertise. So use our capabilities more freely, I think, to collaborate. Cool. I mean, but, 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 yep. so stuff like that's easy to say, <laughs> but we live in a practical world where it doesn't happen. And we live in a practical world where it's easier for types of people and types of agency workers and types of leaders to come in these meetings and say those things, but then in reality, the people on the ground, the, the people of marginalized communities, they don't get the access. They don't, they, so people will say, yes, we want to do these things, and then nothing will happen because it's not led by the people who are actually being in trouble, who are actually facing the, the, the issues at hand. That was a, a, an amazing video. And, and, of, and it's great that you can create something like that. But then someone like myself, for example, who's a, a, a freelance consultant, uh -huh. For me to say, okay, I can do this for free for you, is a, is a, is a burden on my life. Mm -hmm. So it's, the, 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 it's such, there's such different um, conversation pieces when we can say, yeah, we should do these things, we should all come and collaborate, but then ignore what those impact, the impact has on actual real people. With that being said, would there be scope, theoretically, then, mm -hmm. for you to have a consultation with somebody like Chrissy, mm -hmm. where you'd be able to find out where you can maybe obtain resources and funding mm -hmm. from to be involved? in elevating the awareness of a project like that? I mean, it's, I don't think it's, again, it's a similar conversation, but I go back to, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a video, an interview with Daniel Kalua, and he says, I'm not the problem, why are you asking me? <laughs> like, it's, oh, yeah, not, yeah. it's not, I'm not the problem, stop asking me how I solved this issue, yeah. but I didn't create this issue. It's the people who created the issue who need to solve the issue. Uh -huh. They need to come forward and step forward and not just pretend like, oh, it's not really happening or, when it, or, 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 or only get involved when it suits them. Okay. Um, I want to make sure I caveat by saying I am just a comedian. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm obviously very, very passionate about what you guys are saying. And what it does sound like is that uh, you're very much all singing from the same hymn sheet in that Obviously, you're all actively involved in pushing these careers and these opportunities, but it seems that it's really from the powers that be and maybe their resistance to allow you guys to uh, realize your creative potential and by that same token, other people's uh, potential that is the problem. Um, hence, the name of the panel being Fuck the System. Um, we uh, 
have had a lot of time discussing a lot of these points, and I wanted to make sure, just so we don't run out of time, that we do allow for some audience questions and participation as well, because I feel like some of your eyes are like, I still want to know when we can start seeing fuck the system. <laughs> so that time is now. Uh, so we have some questions. Uh, the gentleman in the green hat uh, will stand up first, and then yourself, then sir, and then the gentleman with the glasses next, please. Hello, we're going to keep it quick because I was just on the panel. But um, I was really interested by the points around how the UK government value the creative industries and what we can do to get them to see that, you know, arts and culture are things that people need in their everyday lives, more important than some other sectors that people like to make important. But I also did want to ask, practically, the UK creative industries might not do a lot in terms of lobbying, but it does do a lot in terms of working directly with political parties. And it also does a lot in terms of working directly with um, different groups and different organizations that then go on to lobby government. So do we have a responsibility in the creative industries to ensure that if we're gonna then turn around a, f a couple decades later and say, oh, but now it doesn't work for us, that actually we make decisions about who we work with, how we work with them, and why we're working with certain clients to ensure that we actually protect the integrity of creativity going forward? That's a good question, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, if anyone didn't hear, I just want to make sure I got the question correct. Uh, does the responsibility of ensuring that uh, working collaboratively and lobbying or incentivizing government to support uh, communities and people in the creative industry come from the industry itself? And should we be more discerning about who we work with in order to achieve that objective? Yes? Make sure I got it right. Okay, cool. Um, I would like to start with Alice. Would you like to have a go? Uh, yeah. Um, I, think it's, I think it's about influence and I think it's about um, working out how to give the right people a voice and able to, to be influenced. As you say, you may be uh, a one-man band or you may be a small company, you may not have the influence, but how can you use people who do or people can, who can bring that in to give you reach and influence? So it goes back to that collaboration point, of course with a filter, but how do you use, how do we collectively work together to, to access um, to get our message to government in the right way. Cool. Uh, Chrissy? Um, well, I'm a, we are, a posit we're positive creative activists, so we're much more kind of like, we won't work with anyone who is not doing the best thing for people and planet. Right? So if Barclay, oh, I better not say that. Yeah, if a certain bank that refused. I, they, they didn't sponsor this, so say what you want. Okay. <laughs> Can we cut that from any filming? Because I don't want to get my ass sued. Okay. So if a particular bank that sits on the high street refused to pull out South Africa during an evil apartheid regime in the 80s and still operates in terrible, terrible supporting terrible things, came to us in an NGO and said, we will fund you. And if we had to take their money in order to survive, I would rather we shut down our operation. Because if we don't have integrity and, and authenticity as organizations, then how can we say we're doing X, Y, and Z? We just have to really ask ourselves some really serious questions right now about what clients we work for. Where do we take money from? Are we working for fossil fuel companies? You know, are we continuing to sell shit to people that they don't need? And if we are, we need to really have a word with ourselves. Because we're in a situation right now, and it brings the fear of God into me a lot. You know, I find it really difficult working in this space because we know the science. We have to really, really focus on doing the right thing, all of us, as individuals and as organizations and as agencies. And if we are still taking money from people who are not serving people and planet, then we really, really don't deserve to exist. And that's tough. But that's what I believe we need to do, all of us, from what we, who we follow on social media to what, what we watch on the television to what we engage with, what we buy, what we eat. Every single choice we make makes a difference to our survival. 
And the other thing is, it's really great fun doing the right thing. It makes us feel good. We've got research and data that proves that if we get people to work on purpose-driven projects, people get a better sense of mental health and well-being. And actually, one of the crises we've got right now is a mental health crisis. So if we can really be brave and shift what we're doing, then I think we've got a chance. Thank you for a question. It was a really great question. And thank you for listening. Cool. Uh, I'm free for free, yeah. I'm gonna, you're good? I think, Chris, I think you've taken a cake again. Uh, Sorry. Um, no, no need to apologise. That's what we're all here for um, and how we can fuck the system effectively uh, to create a beautiful uh, utopian <laughs> orgasm. <laughs> I've taken this metaphor way too far. I'm going to move on very quickly because I haven't got much time. Uh, I believe you had a question there, sir, in the front, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I really, really appreciate everything all of you have, have said. Um, I've had a 20 year career in the advertising industry. Um, I went to Bucks University, which is one of the most prestigious universities in the world, pumping out amazing students, multi award winning DNAD students. Um, I went back there a few years ago and the, um, the, the course has gone to pot because the uh, university is opposite a, um, a hospital and the government said, I spoke to the tutors and they, they said, look, we're desperate for nurses, absolutely desperate for nurses. We'll pay you £3,000 for every nurse that graduates from your university. So they pretty much cut the funding for advertising. Um, it's also had one of the most prestigious um, furniture design courses in the country for over 100 years. I went back there as they're selling all of the workbenches, uh, the fine uh, jewellery as well, all of the workbenches gone and they're filling it up with nurses. Now that, that's the government just ripping apart arts and craft within one of the UK's best arts and craft universities. There's nothing any of us can do about that, it's the government led the initiative. So while this talk is about fuck the system, I think it should be called The System Is Fucked. It, it really is. And I, I really appreciate, Hayden, what, what you were saying about um, people are naturally creative and they want to find channels to be creative. And YouTube, TikTok are those channels that do that. And it's up to the people to be creative. Mm. And it's the government who's shutting, shutting down these channels for us to get an education and to get a salary and career out of being creative. So are we, the question is really, this, if the system is fucked, it, are we witnessing an evolution of our industry, creative industry and finding new channels to do that? Good question. Um, I think that's a very poignant point, very well made. It's even scarier when you think, for all of the investment they did in nursing at Bucks, it's like, don't really care about nurses either, this government, do they? Um, but yeah, very good point. Uh, I should definitely start with Hayden then. Um, and uh, yeah, your I thoughts? Think, I think we're def there's definitely, create, storytelling has been around since the beginning of time. And as people, we use stories to realize who we are, to, to feel alive, to, 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 tell us, to tell our senses and our mind that we can achieve something. Creativity is at the heart of storytelling. So there will always be, that people will always try to be creative. There will always be an outlet for that because that's just what makes people people. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, the issue comes though is, is the way creativity is sold. So okay, can you earn money from it? Because as much as I agree about the, the capitalism and the way that people view the world, the current landscape looks like people want to earn money. So how do, how, how do people feel they can earn from this career, from this career path? How do they, how, where's the education behind that? I used to work for the Arts Council, so I understand how the funding works there. And, and again, when you talked about how siloed the teams are in the Arts Council, respectfully, they've, all of their different, um, different disciplines sit on their own teams. They don't, they don't cross-pollinate, they don't work together, they don't talk about their, their they just sit, their team is here, the music team is there, the, um, do you understand what I mean? So, so as, a, as, a, as, a, as a species, will there always be creativity? How we, how we monetize that, how people start to feel like they can be a part of that world is down to people like Sarchi, people like yourselves, who you have that power to showcase different worlds. You have the power to make 
good campaigns that show how impressive um, arts are. You have the power to talk about theatre. I, I, I went to see um, a show about black boys in, in a theatre room recently, and me, me and five other black boys went to see the show, and one of, the, one of my friends brought his son. His son was 17 and said that's the first time he's ever been to a theatre, like ever in his life. When I was growing up, we went as a school, we went to, as a school tour, as a school, school trip, it was a school trip, we'd have to go to see a show of some sort. So those, those are the kind of things that we're dealing with, and, and, and if, if it's only people who have money or have access to these scenarios who are going to see these places, they're the only people who are going to be able to go into them, which is kind of what I was talking about earlier when you're saying that it's not fair for you to sit here and say, okay, yes, we should do all these things together and we should all come together if you have that access and you have that and you have that kind of um, access to wealth, access to, to culture, access to people, when the, a lot of, the large majority of people who are actually driving creativity in the UK don't have the access to that in the first place. So, uh, obviously... Good luck summarising that. No, it's all good. But obviously, <laughs> the lack of money and resources is stifling the democratisation of that industry. Um, it's not even just... A, it's not so much the lack of money. It's a, it's, it's a case of... Or just access, as you said. Access in general. Just in general. And understanding it. And, and the people who do have the power to actually really make a difference don't just be tokenistic about it. Yes. Because that's what it feels like. It always feels like it's tokenistic. Mm -hmm. Very few people actually feel like you're doing the real work. Mm. See. Um, obviously, I think we have... Uh, unless you want to add to that, we have one more question. If you want to add anything to... I was just going to say, I completely agree with you. It's quite scary how the government, at the moment, seems to value science and STEM over creativity. Rishi Sunak in January went out and said, everyone should do maths to 18. I'm sure that, you know, everyone follow their chair. You don't want me doing maths. No, you don't want me doing maths. Um, you don't want that. But that short-sightedness and that oversimplification of the issue is, is fundamentally um, really scary because because the world is more technological and there's more jobs in business and technology, we're becoming Silicon Valley. Val Valley doesn't mean that you don't need creativity and that tech equals maths, and therefore creativity should take a back seat, which is what's happening with investment in schools and universities. Technology needs creativity. That's what makes it different. You, you know, even with AI now, you can use chat GPT to debug your code so what you need on top of that is creativity to find the problem solving the lateral thinking the solutions the curiosity creativity actually makes tech a differentiator not stem is the answer to everything and I'm I think that's been a you know that's taken us back a long time that decision this year so I think it is our responsibility and big firms like Saatchi to join up with our peers to take action and not just get into places and give people access, give people work experience, give people mentoring, give people days when they can understand what all these jobs are, so they want to get into them, but also to lobby the government to be able to put more value on the creative industry. Therefore, people will be paid more, there are more jobs. It's not just a free thing you do on the side because you're good at it and you're living with your folks. I think that's the... It is our responsibility yeah. to make that one, change and drive that change. And there's one of these things take time. Like a good example is the, the England football team. So it's a slightly tangible but understand. When they made St George 10 or 15 years ago, the English football team was all over the place. It was a nightmare. Now St George took years and years to get a new philosophy in the younger teams. Why? It's the reason why the under 17s, the under 21s are now winning European championships and winning competitions. So I say all that to say that. When you're doing these great core programming, you need to keep communicating, you need to keep showing the world what's happening, and, but you need to let people actually grow with it. So it can't just be the same faces. Okay, yes, you are entry level, well done, you've done really well. Maybe get mid level, okay, you've done really well, but that's it. Or it can't be the same faces who feel they get to these places to be a creative, and then there's always these gatekeepers above them who won't let them go any further. There needs to be that, that a pathway, a clear pathway, so that a government can say, okay, if you're going to come in here, you can start here, and then you'll grow, and you'll grow, and you'll grow, and I can see that pathway. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, we may not have time for one more question, um, which is my bad. I should have steered this a lot better. However... Um, yeah, you're doing good. It's been a, it's been a very useful... Um, I hope this has been informative for guys, uh, everybody here, irrespective of... I said guys, but uh, irrespective of gender. Um, but... What is very clear here is that, uh, from all of our panellists, is that being able to uh, identify the problem of the system, uh, which is definitely fucked from a lot of our perspectives, is a large part of the battle. And I think that the uh, 
the work done to basically change the system and rebuild it so that it is more conscientious of uh, you know people from more modest backgrounds, uh, irrespective of their sexual orientation or gender or their race takes place. I think it has to be a collaborative effort, much like this panel was. Um, and obviously, we had never intended to solve it in an hour, but it is a dynamic journey that hopefully we can all uh, benefit from. So I just want to take the time now. Uh, if you do have a question, though, um, the contact information should be available so you can continue the conversation uh, because uh, these guys are all very willing to listen and to give you an idea of whatever trajectory you need to follow to achieve what you'd like. Um, just leads for me to thank our panelists. Please give a round of applause to Alice Flanagan, Christy Levitt, and Hayden Corridus. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much uh, for coming, guys. I love and appreciate the energy. Uh, we will fuck over and rebuild the system. It just requires all of us to be involved. Um, yeah, and this festival is the beginning of that process. Um, if you did enjoy my swearing in comedy, then you can check that out yourself. Uh, but enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you very much for coming. Bye. Thank you.